I'm not going to talk to you about bicycling much. I'm going to talk to you about the motives of those who advocate it. So there's some ground rules. One is cyclists fare best when they act and are treated as drivers of vehicles. We need good roads of adequate capacity. We need fair treatment. Now, the motorist has done us wrong by cramming us over to the side of the road and making us ride in bike lanes and bike paths in some states when they have produced those things. And that was wrong. They should not have done that to us. But they did. Now, here's the funny thing. The bikeways, particularly bike lanes, that were invented by motorists and were opposed by the cycling organizations at the time, both in Britain and here, those things, same discriminatory anti-cycling things are now the subject of the bicycle activists' greatest propaganda activity. And they hate to be told that these things which they advocate so greatly were invented to do them ill. And these poor people are in terrible psychological troubles because, of course, they're trying to advocate something that's against their own interests. Well, why is it? The people that you will meet in transportation advocacy who are bicycle activists are not activists for the welfare of the people who ride bicycles. They are anti-motorists. And it shows, it shows all the way through. Why do they advocate something like bike lanes or other traffic calming things? They're all bad, just about. And in fact, when you do nasty things for motorists through traffic calming, it's the poor cyclists who gets hurt worse than the motorists. Um, there's no need to go into it. Ground rules. Now, so how, about, well, how do you deal with these activists? The reason that they promote bike lanes and bike paths, where they, in some cases, is because not because they do good for cyclists, but because they are attractive to motorists. Now, I've already said there's a bit of truth in that, because motorists, some of them, like to shove us off to the side of the road. So I think it's a good thing. Keep those guys out of our way. But that's not the, what they're thinking. The bicycle activists are thinking that people don't like driving. Well, I mean. Who of us really loves the drive to work? I think there are very few people who do. I knew a man who had the finest way of getting to work I know. He lived in New Canaan, Connecticut, and he was vice president of Pan Am and later president of other airlines, which all went broke. And, uh, but he had a private seat on a private Pullman car all the way from New Canaan right down to Grand Central Station. And Pan Am's offices were in that building. I can't think of a nicer way of getting to work. But it doesn't work for most people. And most people, they don't like driving to work, sure. But on the other hand, they'd rather drive to work than all the other consequences of not doing it. So these people think that because people don't like driving to work, we can offer them something. They also have to think about why do people keep on driving? And therefore, it has to be, well, some, some evil conspiracy is compelling them to drive instead of doing what they think they should do, walk or whatever. So, well, they have conspiracy theories. They think that land developers and r highway builders and motor manufacturers and oil companies all have a grand conspiracy to force us to buy homes in suburbs that we don't like 
so that we have to use their products to get from the suburbs to wherever we want to go. And they don't like suburbs because they think that, that the wrong people live in suburbs, dull people, you know, people with no brains or, or no, no artistic sense or no whatever the hell it is. They think of all these arguments against driving because they don't like driving. They oppose it. And therefore, they promote bikeways and they promote mass transit too for the, exactly the same thing. If you're not going to drive, walking doesn't get you very far in an American city. Bicycling will get you a little bit further, so it's somewhat competitive to driving. And mass transit, they say, is competitive, and we know damn well it isn't. But there it is. There are their choices. So they lump cycling and pedestrian together because they don't have motors. And that's wrong because cyclists act like drivers and pedestrians act like walkers. And they promote uh, mass transit because it's not motoring. Now, this means that they have a vision. They have a vision of a city which can exist in the modern world with much less, they don't say none, much less motoring. So of course it has to be, well, it has to have short distances. High density, oh yeah, short distances. It has to have a centralized uh, business, government, industrial location, because that's the only way mass transit works. So these people have the idea that by promoting bikeways, they're going to end up returning American cities to the design that was effective, shall we say, between uh, say 1920 and no later than 1950. And then was to go back to that. That is their vision. And they are religious about it. They're not talking about the welfare of the people who ride the bicycles. They're talking their advocacy for doing something else again which is anti-motoring and anti-suburbia, a lot of other things. And when you deal with these people, you have to deal with them on that basis. Call their bluff. Because if you start talking about, oh, well, but, but so many people like bike lanes. Well, yes, they do. Why? Because American people who ride bicycles have absolutely no knowledge of how to do it. They've been trained, and I hate to say it, they've been trained by the motorists who ran the highway safety system, safety education and such like. They trained them, stay out of our way or we'll kill you. The cyclist who rides in traffic will either delay the cars, or if the cars don't choose to slow down, they will be crushed. The first is sin, and the second is death. The wages of sin is death. That was the, the wording of American bike safety education, and it still is in many respects. And they're stuck with this. So people believe this, and hence, being motorists and not having learned much about cycling because they don't do much of it, then if you're going to attract them into cycling, they think you've got to attract them into something which will protect them from the danger of same direction motor traffic. They don't give a damn about the guy who comes at you and makes a left turn at you. That's the most frequent motorist cause, cars are ca cause of car bike collisions. They only worry about the people coming up from behind who can see you perfectly well and most always miss you. Okay, so it's a completely irrational system. But th therefore, when you start arguing about it, you can say, well, why don't you act like drivers? And they say, well, we don't want to. Or, or, and here's the catch, a lot of the bicycle activists, they know enough. They ride in the vehicular manner but they advocate not riding in the vehicular manner because they want to attract people who don't know how. That's their motivation. And they think they can achieve some success. Well, nowhere in the world has their program actually reduced motoring. Nowhere in the world has it actually reduced 
accidents to cyclists, for that matter. There are lots of talk going on around it, but the statistics are very iffy. And in every case where they boast about things, you find there's such a host of confounding factors, as Portland, for example. They've increased the bicycle proportion of traffic in near downtown Portland. Well, sure, because they've made Portland so damn congested that the motorists find it's easier, in some cases, to ride in than to drive in. And they say they've, that their bikeway system has decreased the accidents. Well, accidents have, have not changed much, although the volume of bicycle travel has increased. But why is that? That's not because of the bikeways, which have no reason, no physical reason, that they reduce accidents. It's the fact that they've had all the other programs going around to slow down motorists, to make people bicycle conscious, and this kind of thing. And they're all confounding factors. So when you realize that the bikeway, which protects you from same direction motor traffic, which constitutes only, say, 2% of the car bike collisions in an urban area in daylight, it can't have much effect in reducing accidents. So it's all the other reasons. And as I say, if you're going to deal with them, you have to deal with them as if they were relig religious fanatics, because that's what they are. On the other hand, you might find people like me, and even he from the Motoring Association. He we agree, cyclists fare best when they act and are treated as drivers of vehicles. And for saying this kind of thing to groups like this, I am reviled on the internet for months, ever since I made a talk after Randall at Mrs. Self's <laughs> meeting in Santa Barbara. That raised hell with the, with the bicycle activists. There, you've got my point, I think. Well, who and are they? I mean, you kept saying they, and I'm not sure who they are. Oh, the, the bicycle activists. And who are they? Oh. I mean, what's the... Oh, okay, the all right. Um, yes. You will find them in the various local bicycle coalitions. They call themselves coalitions from choice. And they organize to come down to council meetings and talk about bikeways. We've got to have those. There is... At the national level, there's the Association of Bicycle and Pedestrian Professionals, APBB. And notice they put them together when they shouldn't. These are the planners, the guys who issue, shall we say, official certification if you take their courses, which are malarkey, because they're doing the wrong thing. And there is the federal government, which says in ICE-T and all those later ones, it says, bicycle funds shall be devoted for lanes, paths, or shoulders for the use of bicyclists. They can't put bicycle money into simply improving the road, fixing potholes, shall we say, fixing dangerous grates, or just simply widening the road and providing adequate capacity. After all, when the roads are narrow, of course, and I, here's what I need to say. You've got a good cyclist, and he's on a road that's too narrow for the amount of traffic it's carrying. He's going to fill up a whole lane of traffic and slow it down. Well, put a little bit extra width in the, right, in the, in the edge of the road, and he'll use it enough of the time that traffic can get by. And when it comes up to intersections and right turns and left turns, he'll do the right thing, and motors can still get by him. So providing adequate capacity, provided it is not specifically allocated for one mode rather than the other, is a good thing. And these people, they hate that. They hate the idea that doing something good for cyclists might also improve motoring. And that's one of the big political arguments in the cycling world. Yes? Uh, just heard a presentation from a gentleman on a totally different subject that came back from Vietnam as a tourist. Yes. And he was just, the one thing that struck him was he's totally amazed at this sea of bicycle riders going to work every morning, totally mixed in with the cars. There were more bicycle riders than there were automobiles, and people making left turns and changing lanes and everything, and never saw an accident the entire time he was there. 
accident rates in, in those countries are said to be high per mile. But uh, I don't know whether the statistics are very good or not. But that's what is said. However, what you have said is quite, quite reasonably true. In places where motoring is a minority, you find that everybody sort of operates by sort of pedestrian rules, as it, or slow vehicle rules, shall we call them. And that works. Um, in America, it's much more difficult because motoring is a majority. And of course, it is much done in a much faster way because we have good roads and we get around. And the idea is that cyclists in America need to adapt, organize themselves, so that they will adv first act and then also advocate for doing what is best in the cities in which we live and travel, not in some imaginary cities of the past or imaginary cities of the future, if you can get them that way. Yes? I just have a comment that our bicycle advocacy coalitions in California have two full-time paid lobbyists <coughs> in Sacramento. And uh, my cousin works for Caltrans. So the stuff that talks about traffic calming in a negative way here it's okay, here it's not, has all been buried and it's been primarily due to these uh, coalitions. Yes. Um, I was president, uh, director for six years, total f terms, and president for one term of the League of American Wheelmen, League of, Ver uh, League of American Bicyclists now, National Organization for Cyclists. And I got diselected in my run for uh, another term as director by the California Coalition, which was set up with money from the Ohio group of bike path um, advocates who had managed to grab the presidency after <coughs> my term. And they allocated organization funds to oppose one of the sitting directors. That ain't legitimate, not in an amateur organization. These, are, these people are dishonest. They are dishonest because they believe in a greater cause. That's why you've got to deal with them that way. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm a, I'm a driver, a cyclist, and, and uh, pedestrian in Berkeley, California. Yes. Well, the People's Republic of Berkeley. <laughs> and, um, and I was just curious, what do you think of, of the, they have, have allocated certain side roads for cyclists. I mean, they, cars can use them as well, but they're not the main roads for cyclists. Well, I spent uh, uh, 10 years cycling in Berkeley, so I know I'm, I'm familiar if you want to go into detail. Yeah, no, I'm just curious how you like how you think that works. Uh, it seems to work quite well, from my, my perspective, because the cyclist isn't on the main road, they're on a, on a well, this is, is probably the bicycle boulevard idea, whereby some road that takes you parallel to a main road uh, it has, is also protected by stop signs so that you have through travel. But in some ways, by some means or another, it is prevented to have uh, motor traffic is pro prohibited by putting up barriers that you have to dodge through. Now, think of it. In some places in Berkeley, on the south side of the campus, uh, south of Edwards Field, those places, you have diagonal barriers at, in at intersections, which are permeable to cyclists. So you come up in a car, and you are forced to make a left turn. You can't go straight. But and there's no traffic coming the other way, you see, because there's this barrier. Except, of course, there's the bloody damn cyclist who's come through it at you. And he's, got this, he's coming straight at you as if he had the right of way. And you're making a forced left turn as if you had the right of way. Dangerous as hell. Oh, I don't, I don't like those at all. Thank you. That was great, John.